scared yet. The whole point of this video is that nothing is going to be fun. They're all going to scare me. I just want it to be over. I'm so upset. <laughs> this house is so haunted. And it felt like something was gonna like reach out and grab my leg. Oh, it totally ruined my night. <laughs> the ending of this is gonna haunt me. Wish me luck, cause I really do feel like this one's gonna give me nightmares. <laughs> this book is <laughs> ruining my life. Hi everyone, it's Bells. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to your Halloween video. To preface, I have not read a horror book that has truly scared me in a long time. And so I thought, why not enlist the help of my fellow horror booktubers to scare the crap out of me just in time for spooky season? <laughs> now this video is definitely in addition to the Can We Trust Booktubers video canon. This video is not really an original idea. I think the first one I watched was Kayla's, but a lot of people have done them since. The first part of this video is how I picked the TBR, what the TBR actually is, and then we'll move on into a nice long chunky reading vlog. I have a cup of pumpkin chai tea with me, so grab yourself a fall drink and let's get spooky. So I wanted to find the most popular scary books that were recommended. These books, except for one, were picked for how many times they were mentioned as being scary specifically, not just good horror books, but scary horror books by different booktubers who also happen to have at least two favorite horror books in common with me. <laughs> and when I say favorite, I mean like four stars or higher. They are also mostly books that I am interested in reading because of course we are searching for some fun five star scares. So before we start, I feel like I should preface this with what actually scares me and like how I picked the books that I thought would scare me, which is the stack that is off camera right here. Because obviously I want books that I think will scare me. And when I mean scare, like I don't wanna be disturbed. I don't wanna be nauseous, but I wanna have that like bone chilling, like hard to sleep, heart racing kind of fear. I have a couple of different things that I usually look for when I want to actually be scared. The first one is just a really good atmosphere. I'm a gothics girly at heart. So I want like a dreadful atmosphere, just like dreadful ripping intention. Think like Woman in Black by Susan Hill or Haunting of Hill House. Even House of Leaves scared the crap out of me. Creepy children or specifically like children trying to deal with adult horror really gets to me. There's a reason that creepy children are all over every popular horror thing because like it is creepy. Books that have done that with me, Imaginary Friend by Stephen Chbosky, <laughs> which also unlocked a fear of dark forests and deer. So thank you, Stephen. The Shining also falls under this category. And a real life horror does the most for me. In The Shining, like alcoholic abuse of family members or a real life experience. And watching a child have to go through that while also having like a magical ghost experience in this weird, awful hotel. Checked all the boxes for me. Other real life horror, like The Monk by Matthew Lewis. I know that this is like a really old book, like from the 1800s, but man, did it freak me out. Like women dealing with the horrors of men will always be scary. And this one did it really well. I think this is considered like the world's first horror book. So do with that what you will. Near the Bone by Christina Henry also comes to mind. Even some of the slasher sequences from There's Someone Inside Your House by Stephanie Perkins genuinely scared me. What if there is someone inside my house? And finally, I find an element of the uncanny or the strange when it's done in the right way really stresses me out. <laughs> Think like The Twisted Ones by T. Kingfisher. Like who knew weird rocks would freak me out? Also like The Silent Companions by Laura Purcell is about moving wooden figurines. For this TBR specifically, for booktube's scariest books, I'm not looking for fun, campy horror. I'm not looking for gory creature features. I'm not even really looking for slashers. Specifically, I'm trying to keep myself from sleeping. Like I want that like primal fear. And so that's what I'm aiming for. Booktubers that satisfied these requirements. When I tell you I watched like easily 150 booktube videos, I, that, I don't think that's an exaggeration. <laughs> and I mostly watched like top horror books or favorite horror books of the year videos for this. So I'm sure I missed some people, but this is the lineup that I got. So come on down. We've got Kayla with eight horror favorites in common with me as the top. To be fair, her video was very long and had a lot of books in it, but I, I think that is a good gauge of what I will like. Elizabeth at Plant-Based Bride had seven horror books in common. 
Gabby had six. Willow at Books and Bow had five in common with me. Riley, Kaylee, and Georgia all had three. And finally, Ashley had two in common with me. I will show you when I pick up the books, like how many times these booktubers recommended the books I picked, as well as how much these books came up in other videos with booktubers who had less books in common with me or like whose recommendations weren't recommended enough times or that I just like didn't pick for one reason or another, because it's not just these booktubers that I'll be referencing. Okay, you've waited. Let's go through this TBR. Okay, so I've got nine books that we're going to be reading over the next few weeks, and I'm going to let the booktubers who recommended them tell you about them and why they scared them, and then we're going to jump right into the vlog. I'm going to go from the most to the least popular books that were recommended. So up first, Night of the Mannequins by Stephen Graham Jones, just a little baby novella. This was recommended by four booktubers with similar tastes to me, Georgia, Ashley, Gabby, and Kaylee. This is a creepy ass novella, like dead ass it is scary. This one is one of my favorite novellas because again, it's just so weird and bizarre. That is about this group of kids who play with this mannequin. They used to spend their summers playing with him just like kids do. They kind of neglected him for a couple years. They decide to pull him back out for a prank and then the mannequin comes to life and he is on a revenge mission to get back at these kids for forgetting about them. Or is he? I will say you have to go into this book not expecting killer mannequins, instead expect psychological horror. I picked this one to scare me because I have a thing with the idea of something coming to life. I'm hoping that this will cater to that like fearful uncanny that I'm looking for. The next book is one that I have purposely not picked up um, because I know it's going to fuck me up. I'm already 70% vegetarian-ish and I think this book is going to probably force me 100% of the way and I think you can guess what it is and that is Tender is the Flesh by Augustina Basterica. This was recommended by seven booktubers, three of which had similar tastes to me, which is Kayla, Ashley, and Elizabeth, and the other four are Aspen, Erin, Meg, and Amber. It came up so much I couldn't not pick it up which is about this man, he works in a factory which slaughters people um, for human consumption. Animals have been deemed not safe to eat, so they're all engaging in cannibalism. I don't think I have to say how disturbing this book is. It is truly very difficult to read. It is not for the squeamish. And if you already feel kind of weird about meat or have anything in particular with meat, like maybe this one's not for you. This book is very heavy in the body horror, so I would not recommend for people who are queasy. The dehumanization of people is very unsettling and all of the gore involved very uncomfortable. This novel is naturally very disturbing and very graphic but also very thought-provoking. <sighs> like I said, I'm pretty squeamish so I don't know how this is gonna go. I think if I DNF any of these books it might be this one but I'm gonna give it the old college try. We're gonna see what happens. The next book is Moon of the Crusted Snow by Wabgishi Grace. This was recommended by four booktubers, three of which had similar tastes to me. Again, Kayla, Elizabeth, and Gabby, um, and then Meg as well recommended this bad boy. I'm very excited for the atmosphere in this book. This is set within an indigenous community when all the power goes out, they're disconnected from the main city and so they can't really tell what's going on. You know, cold is setting in as you can see. It's kind of set in an apocalypse. It's definitely unsettling. There's a sense of dread as it's the middle of winter and it's about survival, but surviving the elements as well as each other. What it takes to survive and who deserves to. I'm like so excited for something so positively dreadful. Then we've got a book that's been in my TBR for a while, so I'm very excited to have an excuse to read it, and that is When the Reckoning Comes by Latanya McQueen. This was also recommended by four booktubers, three of which have similar tastes to me, Gabby, Kayla, and Ashley, as well as Erin. It's a paranormal horror about the ghosts of enslaved people um, on this plantation. There is definitely a kind of slow burn, but to this very action-packed and horror-heavy revenge mission that these ghosts are on. This book was super creepy in the sense that, you know, a lot of the slaves that had lost their lives on this plantation are haunting this plantation. And so a lot of that comes into this story and it's just the way it's written. It's just so creepy. This is very much a gothic subdued 
type of horror. This was just some of the best atmospheric lush writing I have read in a while. Absolutely horrifying. Honestly, I wasn't sure that this one would really scare me. Based off of the description, I expected it to be more social horror. I mean, I think it's obviously going to be social horror. This is one where I like am fully trusting these booktubers who all said it was really creepy. Then we have the book I'm potentially the least excited for. That's The Patient by Jasper DeWitt. This is uh, about a mental asylum, I believe, and I usually steer away from stories, um, especially horror that centers on the people in psych wards and in mental institutions because I'm never 100% sure that it's going to be done well. But it was recommended by three different booktubers, two of which had similar tastes to me, which was Gabby and Ashley as well as Aspen. So I don't know. Um, this is another one. I'm gonna trust them. Can we trust booktubers? I guess we'll find out. Another one of my all-time favorite horror books that scared me the most personally is The Patient by Jasper DeWitt. Genuinely, like, I couldn't read this at night because I was so scared. We're just following this, like, young boy who is this, who is this patient at this institute, and we kind of follow him from when he's a kid all the way through his adulthood and like nobody knows how to talk to him like they just don't know because like he freaks everybody out basically because he's so creepy the ending is mind-blowing it's kind of like a horror version of the silent patient i think i remember hearing before reading this one that it was so scary and it could mess with your mind i didn't personally have that experience with it but i did think it was pretty good then we have one that's been on my radar for like a really long time and checked off my box for an indie author which i'm really excited about that is stolen tongues by felix blackwell this was recommended by again three booktubers two with similar taste gabby and georgia as well as amber but i have seen this all over i'm part of a horror facebook group because I'm actually a middle-aged woman uh, in a 20-year-old body and this has been all over that group for forever. So like it's about time. And this was the scariest book that I've ever read. Having to turn the lights off and go to bed after reading this was the worst experience ever. First chapter of this book I instantly regretted buying it. This is about a couple and they go on this cabin retreat holiday and then he notices that his girlfriend is asleep but she's like sleep talking and she's actually having a conversation with this like figure outside and if that's not terrifying i don't know what it is this book is one of the few books in this world that made me sleep with the lights on because i was so flipping scared i am quite excited so next we have something like i already had requested at the library so i kind of felt like i should just pick it up because it, I was already gonna read it anyways. That's The Hollow Places by T. Kingfisher. This was recommended by two booktubers, both of which have similar taste to me. That is Riley and Kayla. So this woman is moving back to her small town and her uncle has this museum of strange things and there's a portal to another world. It has its eerie and creepy moments and especially more creepy for the characters themselves and what they're dealing with. Sure, there are like some jump scares, but you're giggling the page after. This is definitely a world that I would never want to go to. It is terrifying. They find different messages like they can hear you thinking, pray they aren't hungry. It's very scary. I wanted to include this because I liked the twisted one so much and people have told me that this is just the better version of the twisted ones. I'm on my T. Kingfisher kick right now and I'm having a great time so I have a feeling I'm really gonna like this one. Then we've got Tinfoil Butterfly by Rachel Eve Moulton. This was recommended by two booktubers both of which have similar taste to me. That's Allison and Kayla and funnily enough watching Allison's vlog where she read this book actually gave me the idea for this video. So thank you Allison. Go watch her videos because they are super fun and engaging. She makes me want to be a better video editor. <laughs> the way that she described this made it sound absolutely terrifying. The story is about a woman who's hitchhiking to the Badlands and she stops in this creepy little town and she eats at a diner and in said diner she meets this boy with a tinfoil mask and she learns that she can't run from her problems forever. It's spooky, it's unsettling, it's confusing but in the most eerie way. The atmosphere was so ominous. It combined real life horrors and more fantastical paranormal spookier elements. And 
And finally, for our last book, all of all of these books that are on the floor in a pile right now, <laughs> they're all relatively short. They're under 300 pages for the most part. And if you've been around my channel for a while, you'll know I really love chunky books, especially chunky horror. I wanted to add a nice hefty read so I could have that experience as well. This book that I picked was recommended by two booktubers, Jordaline and Erin. And though neither of them have similar tastes to me, I really think it's going to scare me potentially the most out of all of these picks. And so I decided to include it because I make the rules for my own video. <laughs> and that is No One Gets Out Alive by Adam Neville coming in at like 600 and some pages. It was a reread for me this year, but it scared me again. I got frightened. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I was like terrified by the end of it. It's about this girl named Stephanie. But Stephanie moves into this like uh, room share kind of house, right? She's moved in here because it's cheap and she needs somewhere to stay because she has no fucking money. Because Stephanie is living in poverty. She struggles to find work. She has no support systems in place to help her in her times of need. This little house full of rooms for rent is actually quite haunted. And on the first night, Stephanie starts hearing somebody scratch at her floor and somebody whispering in her room. So Stephanie then has to try to get out of this fucking house. What's scary about this book is the fucking misogyny. This is one of the few horror books that have actually scared the living crap out of me. I was genuinely scared while reading it. I could feel my heart racing. I was anxious. I was just a bundle of nerves and that is very hard to do for me. The human evil aspect is intense. So here are the books. I'm pretty excited for most of these, honestly. I genuinely feel like I picked a stack of books that will actually scare me. I think No One Gets Out Alive could scare me the most. I think Stolen Tongues certainly has a good chance of scaring me. I think Tender is the Flesh is likely gonna have the longest impact on me because I think this is going to lean more into disturbing than into scary. And then I think, again, the book I'm the least looking forward to is The Patient, but I am very excited to be surprised by this guy. Those are all the books. <laughs> I think this is gonna be really fun. I will check back in with you when I start the first one. I don't know what that's going to be. How am I supposed to pick? I have nine books here. I don't know. I'll let you know when I figure it out. <laughs> So I decided to kick off this video. We're gonna start with The Hollow Places since it was the first book I had coming in from the library. And I know T. Kingfisher is like very charming and, and funny, even though it's horrifying. So it felt like this was a good like easing in to the rest of the books that we've got. And why did nobody tell me that this is Gravity Falls for adults? <laughs> that That's the plot of this book. So this woman, literally, what is her name? Kara just divorced her husband. Her uncle instead invites her to come and stay with him and help out at his weird little North Carolina museum full of random taxidermy things and fake oddities and everything you would expect from like a little creepy knickknack shop essentially like a weird creepy little museum. The Glory to God Museum of Natural Wonders, Curiosities, and Taxidermy. So her uncle winds up needing surgery on his knees so he's in the hospital for a little bit and Kara's like don't you worry I've got it locked down. She goes and cleans stuff up. She winds up finding this portal into what she thinks is like an extension of the room but is definitely much bigger than the room could possibly be. We of course have T. Kingfisher's classic wacky sidekick who in this case is Simon. Simon. Very steampunk gay which I'm kind of into. And so they go traipsing into this the dark, creepy hallway. They find something pretty spooky almost immediately. They've just opened the door into what looks like the other world where they are on this like little island. And there's a bunch of other little islands all like spread out as far as the eye can see. It's not spooky yet but I read the twisted ones and if this is like the twisted ones it's not going to get spooky until we really get into the nitty gritty of what's going on um, and how it impacts her in the real world. So I'm really excited for where this is going. I feel like I just burned through the first 60 pages. I really do like her writing style. It's so engaging and so easy to read. That's all the thoughts that I have on this right now and I will come back to you when something interesting happens or something surprising goes on or I feel like sharing anything else or I finish it. Those are your options. So my last update, literally the next chapter was where it started getting scary. And when I say scary, I mean like 
scary. I read two chapters at night, like while I was in bed and everything was dark and it felt like something was gonna like reach out and grab my leg. It was so unsettling. I had to go and grab my cat and like have her like sit on me so I could go to sleep. The next day, again, I was reading. I kept feeling like I was seeing things out of the corner of my eye. Like it's so unsettling. It's the, the front cover says chilling on it and I feel that deeply. <laughs> This shit is just scary. It's just unintelligible. It's just completely unexplainable and it is frightening. It's like I forgot that the whole point of the video was to scare me um, and this is already absolutely accomplishing that. I'm glad I picked it up first. I feel like this is absolutely gonna be a total win. I also keep forgetting that all of these books are gonna make me feel some kind of version of this. And now I'm like, why did I do this? <laughs> <laughs> what possessed me to want to do this to myself? The thing that I like that's different about this one over the twisted ones, the jokes, T. Kingfisher's like classic little quirky humor, it feels less out of place in this one. It feels much more like a coping mechanism in this book than like forcing a joke, which it kind of felt like in the twisted ones at some point. It feels like all really well integrated in this one. And I'm having a great time, honestly, but I'm also scared, <laughs> like genuinely unsettled. And I am 55% uh, of the way through, by the way. I finished The Hollow Places. I gave it four and a half stars. <laughs> this was so fun and so creepy, genuinely like scared the crap out of me. I think what this book really has going for it is its imagery. Everything is so chillingly well described. There is body horror, there is cosmic horror. Everything is just like so well described that I know exactly what I'm looking at and I hate it. <laughs> yeah, I continued to just like see things out of the corner of my eye while I was reading this. It like genuinely chilled me. But the nice thing about T. Kingfisher and the reason I wanted to start with this is that I knew it was gonna scare me, but I also knew that she would somehow end this book where I wouldn't be scared after it was over. So like the resolution did not go where I expected it to go whatsoever. <laughs> I will not take the enjoyment of where this book freaking goes away from you. Um, and somehow, even as wacky as it wound up being, it was so grounded that it was still horrifying. It's going to follow me like through my everyday, like the, the entities that are in here, they're so well described that I hate. I, I, just thinking about them like sends chills up my spine, like I don't wanna think about them. And thinking about them in the world, like in the real world, just stresses me out. <laughs> which I guess was the point. I left this book feeling better than I did while I was reading it, if that makes sense, like from a fear perspective. I think I mentioned this already, but she definitely like refined, I know The Twisted Ones was her first horror book and this is her second, and she definitely refined that formula a little bit better in here where the jokes and the weird sidekick, Simon is a great sidekick, I love him. He's a half-blind steampunk 40-year-old gay man. They feel a little bit less disconnected from the narrative. Simon feels like a real person, more so than I think the sidekick in The Twisted Ones felt like a real person, but it is still charming. I definitely chuckled at some points, but most of this is just horrifying. <laughs> I don't know how often I was like, Bleh, or like, oh, or gross, or awful, or uh, oh, I hate this whole thing totally awful. I do think the one thing that I'm going to hold against this book forever is that John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt, the song, is gonna be stuck in my head for fucking forever. Be warned going into this. I don't know, I had so much fun reading this. T. Kingfisher writes really fun books and though this horror was absolutely horrifying, I just like genuinely had a great time. What a great way to start off this vlog. <laughs> I went to pick up another book out of my, my stack of horror books that are sitting over here and I was like, oh man, I want something fun. The whole point of this video is that nothing is going to be fun. They're all going to scare me. <laughs> anyway, if you love the idea of portal fantasies and portal horrors and awful fourth dimensional world and entities bleeding into ours, I'd check this bad boy out. to see my little cat in frame here. So I finished Night of the Mannequins. I started it last night and finished it this morning. And like, this was a what the fuck did I just read, but like in a bad way. I did not enjoy this at all. Um, and it also wasn't scary. So the premise of this is that this group of friends who've been friends their whole lives, their senior year, they're going off to graduation after the fact, you know, the, the, the way that teen horrors go. And so they decide to play a prank on their friend who works in a movie theater and bring a mannequin with them, dress it up like a human, stick it in the theater. But then the prank like doesn't really work and our main character thinks he sees the mannequin get up and walk out. And then people start dying 
That's the premise. This did not deliver on the premise. <laughs> first off, and the way that it did deliver, I did not enjoy. This was not fun at all. The main character's head is just an awful place to be. I do have to say kudos to Stephen Grab Jones for just like successfully capturing the stupidity of teenage boyhood, because this main character definitely sounded like a teenage boy and it made me not like him. From the beginning to the end, we know exactly what's going to happen. There are no twists. There's no like obstacles to this character's goals. It just kind of does the same thing the whole time. All of the friends, the characters, had absolutely nothing to the story other than that they are props to be killed. Very a la like Friday the 13th, but at least in Friday the 13th, the deaths were fun and gory. You don't even get to experience really like we get to experience the deaths, but there's no description of them. None of that like slasher gore that that I look for in slashers. None of that was here. It was just so bland. I'm like so disappointed. <laughs> Potential spoilers from here on out because I, I can't talk about this without talking about the spoilers. Because it's it's the main character who's killing all of his friends. It's not the mannequin at all. He's just having a mental breakdown. And we're once again having an entire fucking story based off of mental breakdowns as a trope and how people with mental disorders are going around killing people. And I just don't find that interesting. I don't find that compelling. I'm like already shoving this out of my brain because like I don't want to remember it. I've never read American Psycho, but it could potentially be like an homage to American Psycho or an homage to like any number of different slashers, but I just don't think that that as a concept worked here because we're just talking about like a teenage boy, like he's just a kid. And so watching this like teenage boy have a breakdown and then start killing all of his best friends is just kind of not great. It's certainly unsettling. It's certainly horrifying, but like not in a good way, not in a fun way, not in an engaging way. And it didn't scare me. There was a single moment in the shower where I thought for a second there might be a mannequin outside of the shower curtain. Just a second. But this did not scare me. This did not thrill me. This did not interest me. There was no commentary. I feel like unless I totally missed it, I didn't like this at all. I'm super disappointed. I think I'm gonna give it like two and a half stars, two stars. I don't know. I am 76 pages into this. <laughs> it delivers on the things that it said it would. This is about a dystopian future where cannibalism is sanctioned by the government and the whole world, if they eat meat, they are eating special meat, which is humans. The main character is like the manager of a processing plant and he had planned on going to veterinarian school. And then because of this like weird worldwide virus where all of the animals in the world can now kill humans with like a scratch or anything. Rather than just not eating meat, of course, instead they start processing humans. It's good commentary on capitalism. It's good commentary on slaughterhouses, on how we treat animals, on ethics in general, on media suppression, on indoctrination, on, you know, like etc. etc. Yes, good on the commentary, but for most of this, we're kind- I just feel like I'm taking a tour around the world, which is fine. The world building is solid. I- I personally need to like latch on to something with emotions that I can care about. So not that I don't care about what's happening here, because I do, but I can't like emotionally invest myself in it. Like it's not a fun reading experience because I don't feel like I'm following any kind of trajectory. Like I do just feel like I'm wandering through this world and just kind of like gawking at the horror of it all. Something that I think is really clever but does contribute to that issue is that it's all written in second person. So while we are from this main character's POV, it's all written in like, he said, blah, 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 he experienced this. I think it's really clever because it suggests this degree of separation between us and him and the same way as he is trying to separate himself emotionally from like the horrible things he's doing every day. I don't know, man, this isn't fun. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I knew it wasn't gonna be fun and uh, I hope that it surprises me because at this point, like it's exactly what I expected. And that is kind of unfortunate. I want this to surprise me. The thought of eating meat at all makes my mouth like feel awful. So it's certainly accomplishing something. There is hope of a plot. There's a, a thing that happens. Can I tell you that it's a thing that happens? It's in the flap. So he gets a gift 
of like a very special human who's been bred without GMOs and etc etc. The flap says that he starts to treat her like a human being. So there's hope of a plot. There's hope of me caring about something. I'm bummed out. This is a bummer. Thanks everybody. Thank you to all the booktubers who told me to read this. I hate you. <laughs> I finished Tender is the Flesh. Boy, did I not want to finish it. Uh, this was awful to read, like genuinely such an unenjoyable reading experience. But I do want to start this by saying that like the world building itself and the commentary and frankly, the very scathing critique of capitalist society that's going on in here is astounding. I mean, that's what this book is for. That's what this book is about and that was clearly the goal of this book and it's so successful at that. If I felt like thinking about this book for a, a good length of time I could probably write like an easy 50 pages because I do feel like every other sentence was something that if you think about it for long enough it is like such an indictment of capitalism. In that sense this is fantastic. So it's conceptually very horrifying because pretty much everything that goes on in here you kind of sit there and you're like you know I can see this happening. And that is horrifying. So my last update that I gave to you, oh, it totally ruined my night. <laughs> the the tour through the, the slaughterhouse, the human slaughterhouse. I had a vegetarian dinner on purpose because I knew that I wouldn't be able to like even think about meat. And even then I had to like dissociate from my dinner so that I could actually eat because just the process of eating itself made my stomach hurt. <laughs> you know, if you do want something that kind of ruins your day. I do think this did that. Was it scary for the purposes of this video? I don't think that was the goal of this book. It is terrifying conceptually. The ideas that are being presented here are horrifying. Here's why this is getting three and a half stars. I did not enjoy the process of reading this. There's nothing for you to like connect to in this. Like you might kind of be able to connect with Marcos, who's the main character by the end of the book, but there's no like emotional through line for you to really follow. For me, that's what I like in books. I like my emotional engine. So yes. Oh, is that your bow? Oh my god. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You're so cute! Where was I? I don't remember. I don't need to like a character to, to connect with them or be okay with reading about them or be invested in their story, but there isn't really a story to be invested in. This book is really a series of horrific images layered on top of each other to create a picture of this world. While it is successful at creating a horrific picture of this world, isn't something that's like emotionally engaging to read. I didn't have fun reading this. I forced myself to pick it up because it was just a bummer, but it was a bummer that was so dissociated from emotional reality that I had to actually like work for it to be a bummer, which does add to the horror of it. I, I can commend that because I think that is purposeful, but I don't like reading books like that. I think the ending was probably the most surprising. It was surprising in that way where I was like, God, humanity really can be that awful. Ultimately, this is not a win for me, but it might be a win for you. I mean, clearly this was the most popular book that was on this list. Clearly people resonate with this and I do think the commentary is absolutely fantastic. Like genuinely, I don't want that to be hidden by the fact that I didn't like the way that the story is written. It's not personally for me, but I can absolutely respect everything that's going on in here. I'm not not recommending it. <laughs> And I just want to say I am literally so excited to talk to you guys about a book that I like with characters that are interesting and a plot that I'm already invested in and that has already sent chills up my spine because I started Moon of the Crusted Snow. I needed like a win and a, a pretty obvious win. I wanted to be scared and this was one of the ones where I'm like I was pretty sure at the beginning of this that this one was going to both scare me and be something that I enjoyed and oh man I started reading this. I was like oh it's so nice to just like be in a story that feels like a story. <laughs> We are set in an Anishinaabe reserve in northern Canada. It's a very isolated place and they're just about to head into winter. We open with our main character Evan preparing for the winter isolation. As the days progress, electricity and phone lines all kind of start to periodically go out until all electricity, all satellites, everything is gone. There is no access to phones, no access to heat, no access to the outside world. They don't know why it's happening and a blizzard is here. Just in concept that's frightening, 
What really sent a chill up my spine in the first 50 pages is that Evan's dad has a dream that he tells him and just like <laughs> this dream it's clearly like a prophetic dream and it just sent full shivers up my spine. I was like oh god this is gonna be brutal. This is gonna be rough. I'm so scared. What's gonna happen? Ah, it's already really compelling. I really like all of the characters. I like the community. I just like thinking about people having feelings and connections. <laughs> Sorry. I do actually think it's kind of funny reading this directly after Tender is the Flesh. This also is like preoccupied with food and it opens with this moose being hunted and killed and like the process of butchering it. And you would think I'd be kind of squeamish about it after reading this. The whole point of how Evan prepares the moose is like through respect, which is nowhere in here, right? Like that's what makes this horrifying is that humans are treated as animals. Their meat is not treated as something to be respected. It's meant to be something to be consumed. Whereas in here, the meat is to be respected for giving life to a group of people. So I do think that's like a really interesting contrast that I didn't expect or think about going into this. I'm just so intrigued. <laughs> I love the intrigue factor of this. I was missing it. Sometimes when I have a couple books in a row that aren't wins for me, I feel like I'm just being really judgy. And then I read a book that I do like, I'm reminded that I'm not picky. I just know what I like <laughs> and that's okay. You know how you know a horror book is like actually scary? When you're reading it when it's bright ass sunny outside and it's still scaring you. This is actually really interesting interesting slow burn. I was just kind of like trucking along, enjoying the story, being like, ooh, who are these people? Ooh, what's going on? And then all of a sudden I realized that my heart was racing and that I was like genuinely stressed out reading the book. I just got to part two, which is about like 60-ish percent of the way through. I don't have very much left. All of the different stressors and everything is just building up so well. And now it's winter part two winter. Shit's gonna hit the fan. Shit's already hitting the fan. There's already bodies. I don't know what's gonna happen. I finished Moon with the Crusted Snow this morning and she was just good. She's just a solid four star horror book. I was engaged the whole time. I never wanted to stop reading it and I highly recommend <laughs> if you get to part two and you don't have time to finish the rest of the book, don't start it <laughs> because I started part two in the morning and I had to stop halfway through and I literally thought about it for the entire rest of the day. So just do yourself a favor give yourself that hour or so or whatever you whatever you need to finish it all in in one go it was really compelling i wanted to keep reading it the whole time i really liked the character setup and all of the character work it was absolutely scary like my heart was racing i was i was scared for these people i wish i could tell you what it's really about but i can't that's a bit of a spoiler but i really liked it i really liked how it all kind of panned out this book is really about this anishinaabe community trying to survive in a place where they literally cannot survive they had been forcibly pushed out of their southern communities up into this northern space by the government they were pushed out and they're not meant to survive up there and so that's kind of what this book is about it's about a lot of other things as well but I think that that's like the gist of it that I can tell you I don't have a lot more to say about it honestly it was just good like I just recommend it I just think it was solid I had a good time it spooked me it provoked my thoughts the characters were interesting I was engaged from the very beginning I just had a good time reading this book, which is just a nice feeling, you know, after a couple of duds. Now I don't know which one I want to read next. <laughs> I decided to start The Patient as an audiobook on my way to school today because it's like the first couple of days of October I'm really feeling the spookiness and so I wanted a horror book to take to school with me. And so I did start The Patient. I'm so interested in what is going on. Let me just like so the premise is this hotshot psychiatrist has gone to this like kind of underfunded place in Connecticut because his whole thing is that he wants to help the patients that nobody wants to help. He wants to be the, the person who never gives up on a patient just because they have a mental illness that is challenging. He starts working and there's this weird patient in this hospital who apparently somehow manages to incite all of his doctors into committing suicide. This patient has been in the hospital for his entire life. He was placed there when he was six years old by his parents and has had decades 
of crazy things happen around him. The way this is written is really interesting. It's written kind of like a Reddit post. So the psychiatrist years later is like going over all of the facts of the case, which is really fun because he doesn't write it all in one go. He writes it like in little pieces. So he also responds to commenters and things like that. Like when he starts the next section, he'll say things like, oh, some of you have started to understand what's going on, but you can't know the whole story yet because you don't have enough information. The mystery is driving me crazy. I'm a good portion into this already, probably close to halfway. Honestly, it's so short. The audiobook is only like four hours. Parker is our main character and he has just met this patient, Joe, for the first time. The only thing I'm going to tell you is that I genuinely did not expect how that meeting was going to go. And I am so fascinated. I'm so curious. I don't know what's going on and I want to know. <laughs> but like all of these things on the back are like insidious evil, fascinating and frightening, crisp and creepy psychological horror. I'm sorry, I'm not scared yet. What the fuck is coming? <laughs> I believe the booktubers who said this was going to be scary. And now I have no idea what to expect. So I, I'm i taking the day off from school today because like I've been writing too many essays and all the things. I'm gonna decorate the space for fall. I'm very excited, which I, I might take you along with me. I'm um, just in little bits and probably keep listening to this while I do so because I, I feel like I just wanna read this whole thing today. I'm like literally half an hour away from the end of this. And so we just got the reveal of what is actually happening. Y'all told me this was gonna be scary. This is not fucking scary. This is just sad. This is just a sad story. And now I'm sad. I'm gonna finish it now and give you my final thoughts. But I just wanna let you know right now that I am not scared. I'm just sad. It's just a dark, sad story. And now I'm mad about it. Okay, you're welcome. Um. I am shaken. The implications of the ending are, I think, what people mean when they say that this is scary. <laughs> and the person who said that this was psychological horror, yeah. This was so fun to read. It was such a quick read. It was really engaging. There's certainly some really disturbing things in here, but all in all, I wanted something like fun and fast paced and a little bit gruesome. And that's exactly what I got. It was really compelling, clearly. I mean, I read it in a single day. The structure of having it in internet posts makes for a really engaging style of storytelling. You can imagine waiting for the next installment in every break because you want to know what happens. Resolution that I thought was a resolution half an hour ago. I mean, obviously I knew it wasn't going to be the end because there was still half an hour of the book left. It's still sad. And I do think some of the best horror books are really sad because we are dealing with grief and death and awful entities. I guess we can trust booktubers on this one. I genuinely feel like the ending of this is going to haunt me. <laughs> This is really fun. This is really great. Why am I doing this again? So someone please tell me. I think this will get four stars. Really solid. Super fun. I feel awful. I'll come back to you when I've started something else that will also make me feel awful. <sighs> Jesus. So I'm literally getting ready for bed and I was just gonna start no one gets out alive and I just skimmed through the chapters this is like a 600 page book <laughs> the chapters are split up into day one two three four five six seven eight nine and then nine days in hell literally what does that mean now I am nervous <laughs> god damn it so I'm about 20% into no one gets out alive this house is so haunted. The book opens and we're dealing with ghosts. So we're following Stephanie who has been kicked out of her house by her stepmom after her dad has died. So like very modern Cinderella retelling almost, but it's horror. Oh, hello little cat. And she is just trying to survive. She's just trying to find a way through the world. She works for a temp agency. So like she doesn't have a consistent job and she has been living in essentially a closet until she finds a room 
in this old decrepit house that is being sold for like super, super, super cheap. And she jumps at the chance to take it so she doesn't have to keep calling her ex-boyfriend to go and sleep at his house. Literally the first night she's sleeping in this house, there are ghosts, there's a woman crying in the fireplace, and she's pretty sure there's like a man in the room that comes and sits down on the bed. When she turns the lights on, nothing's there. Everything's gone. Where are the ghosts? What's going on? So she like almost immediately goes and tries to talk to the landlord. Is like, hey, I want my deposit back. And he's like, mm, no. <laughs> and he's super weird. Him and his cousin are who run the house. Like I just finished a scene where it's her third night at the house. And then he like brings a bottle of wine to her room and just sits in her room on her bed and then his cousin shows up and then he also comes and sits on the bed and she's just sitting there like forced to drink a glass of wine with these two men that she doesn't know who are making her uncomfortable. Ah, I don't know. I don't know, man. It's so weird. And then as she asks them to leave because they're making her uncomfortable and they're like, oh, we didn't mean to make you nervous. We're not bad people. We're not like that. And the cousin who is like super weird, we've spent less time with him than with the landlord. The last thing he said to Stephanie was, don't worry about them, as in the voices and the ghosts, they can't hurt you. This book is called No One Gets Out Alive, so I think he's a liar. <laughs> it's so ominous, it like makes my heart pound every time I pick it up to read it, but I am very wrapped up in it. The writing is super accessible. A lot of short sentences to kind of mimic that quick pacing, like like a racing heart. The chapters are super short, so it, it's very digestible. It's definitely spooky. I don't know where it's going. I was expecting the ghosts to like ramp up, but as I said the other night, like there's only nine days spent in the house and then nine days in hell. I don't know what that means, but the fact that she only spends nine days in this house and already on day three, I'm like, what the hell happens? What is gonna happen in this book? This is definitely a book that is very preoccupied with the idea of poverty, like how poverty functions. Stephanie doesn't have anything to fall back on, so she's just stuck staying in this definitely dangerous situation. Is poverty itself the real horror? Or is it awful, uncomfortable men? Or is it both? I think this one's gonna be another bummer. So I am halfway through this lovely little book and now I know what the book is about and I can confirm it is indeed very scary. Um, and really awful and genuinely quite upsetting. Remember this morning when I was like, yeah, I think this is gonna be a bummer. Yeah. It's a real fucking bummer. This book is reminding me a lot of Last Night in Soho. It's not the same plot, but it does have the same themes. That is potentially a spoiler if you've seen the movie. But if you haven't seen the movie or if you have seen the movie and want to read something that's dealing with the same issues in a different way, this is that. I don't know if it's good yet. I don't know if the ending of this is going to be worth all of the, what, uh, what I am enduring. Oh, man, I'm so upset. <laughs> These books are so upsetting. <laughs> I'm having a good time. I don't want you to think I'm not having a good time, but I am upset and sad and definitely more than a little bit dealing with the existential crisis of living in the world that we live in. If that's not a ringing endorsement for a horror book, I don't know what is. I will probably update you when things are done, when it's over, unless anything like really significant changes and happens. I do want to say you should definitely check the triggers on this book. Oh boy. Oh boy. So I finished this. I have some thoughts. I mean, I'm going to split my thoughts between the first half and the second half. So if you remember, there was like that split in the, the contents that I showed you where nine days in hell happened. And I was like, oh my God, what does that mean? So that marks, can I tell you this? It's like a, a separation. There's, there's a separation between the first half and the second half. We're still following the same character. We're still following Stephanie, but there is like a distinct story break. Um, and so I rated the first half of this book before that four stars. And I rated the second half of this book after that, the whole nine days in hell section, one and a half stars, which evens out to 2.75 stars for the book. The first half, we're gonna talk about the first half first, okay? Which is all the good things. Freaking scared me, okay? This scared me. It like, packaged up all of my fears and then hit me over the head with them. It was really well done. And I was a little bit wary about a man 
writing a story like this that is so clearly about women's trauma. And while I think he did mostly a good job, there are a couple of lines, a couple of the things of language in here that I was like, ah, oh, this could be nominated for like men writing women. I liked the first half. The figuration of the house and how the ghosts contribute to the house were interesting. I think this would be a better book if there were no ghosts in it, genuinely. Like if we just kept it with the human monsters in here, it would be more concise, it would be more clear, it would be so much less repetitive. The ghosts don't actually add much to the story other than providing a reason at all for there to be a second half of the story. And let me tell you, we're gonna talk about the second half now, that second half is so redundant. We're just doing the same thing over and over and over again, but Stephanie has less agency. She has pretty much no agency. We're hearing the ghosts say the same things over and over and over again. The ending feels very melodramatic, very over the top, and honestly felt very similar to the Stephen King grass in the tall grass story. I only watched the movie of it. It felt like that. The first half of this is really solid. <laughs> All of the characters are written in dialect. It's set in England. The villains are very dynamic characters and they are very scary and they are absolutely effective. So they definitely did what this video was meant for it to do. After we to have the, the break in the middle. I was like, why am I fucking reading this? I had to force myself to finish it. This was exhausting to read. It's so redundant. And like, why does Stephanie not have any agency anymore? She is such a fiery character in the first half. She The whole reason that she survives is because she absolutely refuses to do anything that these men want from her. I don't, I just, I didn't find it interesting. I didn't find the, the resolution interesting at all. It felt like it took the concept of these awful, horrible, scary men that do exist in the world. These people exist and they do do these things. And it made the fact that they do these things a product of this one particular entity that's haunting this house rather than them just being awful and evil. It takes the onus of responsibility off of them and puts it onto this entity. So now it's no longer about these men doing the thing. It's about the entity that made the men do these thing, this thing. I'm not interested in that story. I'm sorry. Suffice to say, I'm a bit disappointed. <laughs> I had really high hopes for this one. 2.75 stars. It was fine. Honestly, talking through this makes me feel like it deserves a lower rating. <laughs> The, the beginning was good. It deserves, I think that that first half deserves four stars. It's the resolution that makes the entire thing invalid. And I think this book would have been much better had it been 400 pages and did not have ghosts or the ghosts had like an active part of the story that's is that really like you have so much there's so much in here with all of these fucking ghosts there are so many ghosts this place is so haunted and there's so much language and interaction with these ghosts and they don't do anything they are just figures they are just props and that is like more offensive to me than the rest of this because these are all people who have died in this house, right? No one gets out alive. And you've turned them into props, completely dehumanized props that just incite fear and loathing and literally don't do anything else. Maybe I'll lower it to a few stars, genuinely. I, the more I talk about it, the more this book makes me mad because it didn't need to be this way. The, the bones of this, the actually interesting part of this is really solid. It's not a bad recommendation, it's not a bad book, but it is not a book that I will be recommending. Hello, I'm back. Ignore the pile of clothes over there. Okay, so I am 75 pages into When the Reckoning Comes and oh my god, I cannot tell you how nice it is to read a book with a point that is very clear from the beginning. <laughs> Oh uh, man, the writing is so good, the characters are so good, I'm already so invested, and I'm already scared. But in like the nauseous way, in the way that like this is, people suck, man. This is following Mira, who is a black woman who has escaped her white 
small town that she grew up in and is now a teacher 10 years later and she is called by her best friend from childhood who she hasn't talked to in a long time who is like hey I'm getting married I want you to be there. So she goes she decides to go. Turns out the wedding is happening on a plantation that's been turned into a tourist trap where white people get to dress up in little antebellum era outfits and go and wander through this revisionist version of the plantation and a bunch of black staff who are all reenacting the experience of being slaves for this white audience along with like black bartenders and black ticket takers and like there is not a single white person on staff and when Mira wanders through this this place she's the only black person who is there as a guest. So that made me so uncomfortable. It's so nauseous. It's so nauseous inducing. It's so awful. Uh, <laughs> it's so gross. <laughs> the third one in the trio is, is a boy named Jesse. Mira has a thing for him, has always really liked him. Something happens when they were kids between Mira, Jesse, and Celine caused a huge rift between all three of them and is the reason that Mira was like really dedicated to getting out of the town. The writing is super clear. The, the themes of the book are super clear. We are talking about racism. We are talking about privilege, we are talking about class. We are also getting chapters from, I think, from the ghosts. And that, that is fun. That is spooky. I have a feeling that this is gonna get to be quite a bit. I mean, it's in this video for a reason, right? It's it's listed as a, a scary book for a reason and I'm feeling it already. There are ghosts that kill people. They are staying here for a wedding. It's the first wedding that's happening on this plantation and it's gonna be a shit show. It's gonna be a shit show. Did I finish this book instead of starting an essay that was due tomorrow? Yes. One of the easiest five stars I've ever given a book. Genuinely so fantastic. This, this book right here, this is how you write ghosts when you're telling a story about human evil. This is it. No one gets out alive. Wish it did half of what this book did. <laughs> it's so good. It's so clear. The writing is so visceral. It's so honest and evocative. There's so much emotion wrapped up in it. I mean, it is a Southern Gothic, so like it's all about the emotion, but this emotion is so well mediated through themes of privilege and class. Everything is so clear. You can tell that um, Latanya McQueen was writing with like a very clear purpose in mind. There's a couple of really interesting like plot devices that are used here, namely shifting between like the historical perspective with the ghosts and the present day perspective. Um, so there's actually three timelines running through this book, but it all feels very manageable. It's probably one of the most clear uses of multiple timelines that I've read in quite a long time. And let's talk for a second about the horror because you're watching this to get ideas for like something that will scare you. Team, this was so lot. <laughs> it was a lot. It's about enslaved people. It's about a plantation, so like, check all the triggers all the triggers are here it's very brutal but like the horror itself is so visceral it is gruesome it is disturbing it made me fully nauseous and it's very memorable like there are a couple of images in here that are going to live in my brain rent free probably for the rest of my life if you like that that visual representation of horror oh man this does it very very well i i genuinely don't have much else to say about this i thought it was fantastic probably one of the best books I've read all year. I'm so glad I included it in my gothics video as like a preemptive recommendation. Yeah, read the book. I don't know what to tell you. If you need more of an excuse to read this book, the dedication reads for those who have yet to see. Read the book. Read this. Read this. Read this right here. Oh my god. It's so good. It's so good. I can't believe I still have two books left on this list because I kind of wish I had ended with this because it was such a winner. I feel like that's unsurprising. So I'm actually going to go and I'm going to start Stolen Tongues with you all right now. We're going to read the prologue and I think it's going to be really creepy and I hope that it's going to be really creepy so that this is like a fun little interlude since I've probably been talking in this video for a very long time at this point. I've got my trusty books of horror coffin bookmark. I've got this book. Let's do this.
long. Only 10 pages. Very effective. Very creepy. So I'm like 80 pages into this. I'm actually listening to it as an audiobook just so I can like get these books done because I'm kind of getting excited to read anything other than things that are gonna make me upset. And this had me full body shivering as I was walking to school, which I think is a like a feat. That's something to say when you're like walking in bright daylight and just listening to an audiobook. Full body shivers. I like literally gasped on the sidewalk because something happened that was so scary. And the inclusion of the narrator's voice is really effective because the horror here is like mimicry. The, this couple, Felix and Faye, are celebrating their engagement. So they go up to Faye's cabin or um, Faye's fa family's cabin for like a fun little weekend. <laughs> Almost immediately, they start hearing things in the woods that sound like people that they know people that they know who have died. So Faye is like a sleep talker and a sleepwalker. Felix realizes at one point he's like listening to her sleep talk and is realizing that she's responding to someone, like someone is talking to her and she's answering their questions in her sleep and giving that thing like information about the two of them. Yeah, it's fucking creepy <laughs> and I sleep talk and this is not helping anything. <laughs> it's just, like, I don't like, the implication that I could be answering something in my sleep. Excuse me. Ah, I do feel that Felix is like really dismissive of Faye, just the way that he talks down to her and about her. So I don't love that, but the scares are definitely scary. So I'm hoping that that kind of like resolves itself because this is scary and I'm having a good time. I think I'm about 80 pages-ish in. I don't feel like I'm gonna have a lot to say really about this book until the end. So we will see where this goes. Uh, wish me luck, because I really do feel like this one's gonna give me nightmares. <laughs> So I'm almost done, still in tongues. I could have easily finished it last night, but I was genuinely too scared to read it before bed. I have an evening class, and so I was walking home at night and I was like flinching at my own shadow. Someone like ran past me, which why would you be running on the sidewalk at like 8 p.m.? That's not very nice. And they ran past me and I like full body flinched all the way over. Like this book is <laughs> ruining my life. I don't really care about the story. I guess what the twist was, it didn't really feel like much of a twist. And I don't really like the way that Faye is written and as though she as a person is the problem. She's too able to be manipulated and that's the reason that this thing is after them is because she is suggestible in her sleep, not the fact that every person is suggestible in their sleep because it's sleep. I don't know, I don't like really like it, but I am scared of it. I had to preemptively apologize to my partner in case I talked and said weird things overnight while I slept. So I think this book might be the scariest of the bunch. I'm like just trying to finish it. I just want it to be over. Oh my God, I think this, this video is finally taking its toll on me. So I'm gonna finish it on my walk to school today and it is sufficiently gloomy outside, let me show you. So it's raining and cloudy. I will let you know how it ends if I like the ending. If not, I don't think it really matters. If you do want a good scare, this one will absolutely, absolutely scare you. Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm back. I finished this. Let's start. The scares in this book are top tier. Five stars for the scares. If you're just looking for something to keep you from sleeping, to make you jump while you're walking around, um, this will definitely fit the bill. Beyond that, great recommendation for the purposes of this video. Very scary. Great. Let's talk about the ending. A lot of people have said that the ending of this book is unsatisfying, anticlimactic. I understand why. The horror of this book is all happening within Faye's mind. We only experience it through Felix's POV. And so we are really only getting the after effects of the horror and the physical representations of the horror because the actual fight is happening within Faye's mind. So unfortunately, what Blackwell does is he puts us in the mind of a bystander to the horror rather than the actual person experiencing the horror. And so we can never fully know what's going on because we're not in Faye's mind. We are only experiencing it secondhand. The ending is based off of Faye's fight 
against this entity. She has support from Felix and from their friends and all of the other people who have like kind of gathered around them. It could still feel climactic even if we're experiencing the story from a bystander's perspective. I think there's a way to do that really well and in a nuanced way. I just don't think this book really does that because what the epilogue tries to do is talk about how active Faye is as a character, talk about the agency she she has and how she uprooted her repressed traumas and like really challenged everything that was going through her mind and like she did the work. But that is totally disingenuous to the entire rest of the book. Faye does not do anything in this book. Felix does everything. He's the one who calls her parents. He's the one who goes up to the cabin by himself. He's the one who experiences all of the things. He's the one who pushes her, who asks her questions, who forces her to challenge her repressed traumas. She has no agency in this story because she is not the POV character. Felix is the POV character, and so he has to be the active figure in this relationship, and that means that he takes all of Faye's agency away from her, and it's just about him essentially forcing her to confront things she doesn't want to confront, and then that literally comes to, like, arguments. Like, she is not consenting to doing this, and the epilogue tries to tell us that she is, but that's not true. <laughs> I think that that's why the ending feels so anticlimactic because it all gets resolved in Faye's mind and we have no experience with that. We don't know the kind of agency that she has or that she is doing within her own mind because we are only getting her through Felix's perspective and he is fairly dismissive and treats her as being a passive like shell for this entity to come into rather than as an active agent helping him and helping herself in resolving this situation. Kind of a bummer, we only experience Felix's experience of the horror, which actually has nothing to do with him, has everything to do with Faye, and yet somehow we are making the story about this man instead of about the woman who is actually experiencing the horror. <laughs> so, a scares, five stars. Total five stars for scares. So scary, super scary. Story, meh. I appreciated the indigenous representation. I thought that was well done, but like, I don't know. This is a book that I will suggest people read if they just want to be scared, and if you don't really care about the story. In my opinion, it is written from the wrong person's point of view. So I'm giving it three stars, because uh, the scares were good, but the story was not. Which means we're on to our last book, friends. So I'm gonna tell you a little secret. I actually started this, Tinfoil Butterfly, before I really got into Stolen Tongues. And I read the first chapter of this book and I am only one chapter in. I read the first chapter of this book and I realized I was going to like this main character so much. And I loved the way that this was written and the themes that were already being brought up so much that I purposefully just dedicated my time to finishing this book rather than trying to read them both at once because I really wanted to make sure I dedicated real care care to reading this because based off of the first chapter alone, I have incredibly high hopes for this book. The chapter opens with Emma. Emma is our main character. She is hitchhiking to the Badlands. The first chapter is literally just about how she is hitchhiking to this place. I literally don't know anything else about it. I'll read a little bit more and then I'll give you a, a rundown of what this is actually about. But yeah, I, I loved the first chapter of this so much <laughs> that I didn't want to read it in tandem with anything else. So I'm very excited to keep going with this. I'm really sorry. I didn't tell you anything about this book. Um, I finished it. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't read this with you at all. I'm, I'm sorry. This is such a beautiful book. I, I want to just like pick it up and read it all over again. The prose is so beautiful. It's so cinematic. I don't know if this is just because I've been reading a lot of really bummer scary books in this video. I didn't really particularly find it that scary. It was definitely dreadful, it was definitely unsettling, but that wasn't really what this story was for me. I mean, this story is a story of trauma and identity formation, who we want to be and how we want to become it. You can be a good person and still do bad things, but you can always make up for it. God, I'm sorry, I cried at the ending and now I feel like I'm gonna cry again talking about it. It's just really beautiful. I The prose is just absolutely gorgeous. The visuals are so stunning. This is such a weird book. 
book to end on because like I want to give it five stars. I don't even know if I told you what this is about. So this is about Emma who is running away from her life, the life that she has left behind where she has done some pretty awful things and awful things have been done to her. She is doesn't really have a plan. She's just running. She winds up in this diner. In this diner she meets a little boy wearing a tinfoil mask who is absolutely one of the best characters of the year and follows him into the woods where she uncovers, I mean, a pretty horrifying situation. It definitely blends a little bit of the supernatural with the rest of the horror. And I, I don't think it's just like metaphorical supernatural. Like I do think it was actually supernatural. There is some kind of evil in this space on this land. This book is so much more than that. And it means so much. There's so much to it. It's just absolutely gorgeous. This feels like a really weird book to end on. It's remarkably hopeful in comparison to everything else that we've been reading. Like this is a bummer that still makes me feel better about the world and about my place in it. And that's a really beautiful thing. I think it is probably because I've just kind of worn myself out on scares, especially after Stolen Tongues. I mean, nothing is scary after reading Stolen Tongues. Any scares that were in here probably fell flat for me. It was certainly dreadful and certainly unsettling. The atmosphere was just so thick, and I do love that. But this, this was fucking beautiful. So I'm sorry I didn't really update you at all while I was reading it, but I just wanted to finish it and just be in the world. So I'm still in my pajamas. Give me a few minutes and then I will take you over to the bookshelf and we will do a quick wrap up of all of the books that we read in this video. What a wild ride. Hello team. I'm caffeinating. I'm in a different shirt. Let's go. We read nine books in this video. There are a few books I had to return to the library, so those are going to be symbolized by my really lovely renditions of the, the covers. We have some absolute wins. The Hollow Places, Tinfoil Butterfly, Moon of the Crusted Snow, When the Reckoning Comes, and The Patient, all of which were just like all absolutely fantastic. We had a couple of losses. I would say that Night of the Mannequins, No One Gets Out Alive, were both losses for me. Night of the Mannequins because I just didn't like it. I just had no fun at all whatsoever reading this. And No One Gets Out Alive. I gave it a lot of shit in my initial review and that's because all of the stuff that could have made this book fantastic was in this book and just the way that it all panned out really irritated me and it irritated me because I could see like where this book could have gone and I wish it had gone there instead of where it went. No hate to the booktubers who recommended this. They love this book. I totally understand why and I genuinely think I'm so upset about it because I wish I could have loved it. Then we have Stolen Tongues which was the scariest book by far, but the story just like was not there for me. And finally, we read Tender is the Flesh, which is way more fun to think about than it is to read. <laughs> the more I think about this book, the more I wish I had liked reading it, and the more I want like an excuse in a class or something for me to read it from an analytical perspective so I could like write a paper on it. I think it has so much to say. I just really didn't enjoy the process of how it said it, which <laughs> is fine and was absolutely the point, but it does keep it from being like a favorite for me. Most scary, obviously Stolen Tongues, but The Patient was probably the most upsetting. I left this book feeling incredibly upset. I had to go and like just sit on the floor in the kitchen for a little bit after reading this. Like it made me so uneasy and so unsettled. Like I had such a hard time kind of getting out of the funk that this book put me in. So definitely catered to the point of the video. Tinfoil Butterfly is probably the least scary. I <laughs> realized watching back the footage that I picked this for the idea of dread and like unsettling, but I don't think anyone actually said that this was scary. So that's my bad on picking this, but I'm so glad I read it and I literally don't even care. I know we just talked about it, but God, this book was so beautiful and definitely a good pick for those of you who aren't super horror lovers. I think this would be a really great introduction to the genre that's just like absolutely stunning. We had two five-star reads, which is such a freaking win. We have a really wide gambit for this video, which makes sense because horror is such a 
personal subjective experience. Something that's going to be scary for someone is not going to be scary for someone else. Something that resonates with someone will do absolutely nothing for someone else. I mean, Night of the Mannequins. <laughs> Night of the Mannequins was the most popular book. Well, Tender as the Flesh was technically the most popular book that I found, but Night of the Mannequins was the one that was recommended by the most booktubers that had stuff in common with me. And I did not like this at all. <laughs> So like that just goes to show how horror is so subjective and really does have to cater to like personal taste. That's why I think doing stuff like this is so important because I picked up a bunch of stuff that I wouldn't have picked up otherwise and I found some like really good things and I found some really not good things. I know we started this video in the middle of September and it is now October 23rd. So I have spent six weeks reading books and this was the very first one that we read. Man, this, this was so good and so much fun and so scary. Like what a way to kick off the video. What a way to end the video. I have to give credit where credit is due and like thank you to all the booktubers. The answer to the question, can we trust booktubers? Yes. Yes, we absolutely can. Look, sometimes you're gonna get duds, but you know what? You'll find books that thoroughly surprise you. It'll encourage you to pick up books that have been on your list for a long time that of course are five stars because why wouldn't they be? It gets you to read the popular book that you really didn't want to read because you knew it would ruin your day um, and it did and you're happy you read it anyways. Thank you to the, the canon of can we trust booktuber YouTube videos because I would not have been able to make this content without the ideas all coming at me from other booktubers. Thank you to all the booktubers who I referenced, um, even the people who I did not show in the video. I watched so many people prepping for this video and I just had so much fun taking in all of this beautiful lovely content that everyone on the platform is making. I have so many books on this list, like so many, like my spreadsheet, because I, I needed a spreadsheet for this. My spreadsheet is very long, <laughs> so if you would like to see another rendition of the booktube scariest books video, please let me know. This was genuinely such a fun video to put together. I would love to do it again, so if that's something you're interested in, please let me know in the comments. I hope you're all having a very spooky October, a wonderful Halloween season. I will see you all soon in my next video. Bye. Thank you so much for watching.